Warning. The following podcast contains two morons talking about sophisticated subject matter, like ninus and hoo-hahs. Also, a few whoopsie-daisies and at least one house or ante. If you don't have a strong stomach, you know where the door is. Right. On with the shenanigans, then. The podcast which you are about to hear is an account of the tragedy which befell two washed-up losers. In particular, Court Psyops and his immature co-host, Matt. It was all the more tragic in that they were uncultured morons. But had they lived very, very full lives, they could not have expected nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see each week. For them, an idiotic podcast show became a nightmare. The events of each week were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, Cinema Psyops with Court and Matt. What is Psyops? Psyops for psychological operations is very simply the art of influencing how people feel and think and ultimately how they behave and what they do. You don't have to defeat the enemy on the battlefield. It's better if you can convince the enemy to do what you want him to do without having to fight him. And that's really the intent behind Psyops, to convince people to do what you want them to do. So how does PSYOPs fit into what's happening now? The two points I'd like to make with you and the audience is that, first and foremost, PSYOPs save lives. But the second thing I'd like to say, a lot of people have misconception about PSYOPs. They think it's something deviant and brainwashing. say you don't know exactly what's going on right now, but we do know that there are some psyops going on, right? Ma'am, I don't know. Cinema psyops. And I believe with all of my heart that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. Why I believe that is because I know how it feeds. I know what it does to you. Cinema psyops. They think it's something devious and brainwashing. Welcome to the 279th episode of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, doing his weirdest, lowest, most distorting the microphone element possible rumble of a hello to greet you on the show, and sitting all the way across the entirety of the city of Omaha is my co-host, Matt. Hi! That was a that was a sexy growl you put in there. Put a little gravel in your voice on that hello. That was nice. Yeah, was nice. it's getting low. That'll get uh, that'll get some of the people, uh, you know, depending on their persuasion, that, that might get some people all hot and bothered. Well, panties are going up or down depending upon the amount that people liked. <laughs> or their underwear. They can wear normal underwear. That it doesn't have to be panties. Well, panties are normal underwear. It just depends upon what your persuasion is and what you like to wear. Yeah, who knows? Maybe there are. There's just no underwear. <laughs> That's what I like to call a bonus. Yeah. Now <laughs> we're talking. <laughs> yeah. All of this sexy titillating stuff is going to go right out the window the minute we start talking about Beast in the Cellar. Of course, because it's going to have to. <laughs> <laughs> this is the unsexiest movie we've done in a long time. <laughs> this is, hey, you never know. There might be people who like older ladies. <laughs> people who are into gilfs? Sure. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> it's not that these ladies wouldn't necessarily be unattractive. It's that everything about this movie just makes me want to never have sex again. It's 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 very sad sometimes. Uh, <laughs> this right. is not a friendly movie. Yeah, we should probably dig in a little bit on the production company. Have you been aware of Tygon Pictures? I know we've done at least one other Tygon film before uh, in the past. I am not. So, no, I'm not aware of it. Okay, yes. We did The Curse of the Crimson Altar, aka The Crimson Cult, which was a Tygon Studios film, and they did a couple of other films here and there, and this is one of them. Beast in the Cellar huh. is one of their films. They were a British film company that were trying to basically make their mark and just basically be like, hey, we're, we're doing this in the late 60s, early 70s. Hammer has been around forever. What can we do that's different that they haven't already covered? Yeah. So they kind of went the opposite direction of what Hammer was kind of doing at the time, and they just tried to provide an alternative, and again, very low budget stuff and 
and all of that. Uh, we got another movie coming up in the lineup that I know for sure is another Tygon film. I only know Tygon basically on the periphery. Yeah. Because I never paid close attention. I just watched the movies. So when I'm like, oh, so that's a Tygon film? Yeah. They did a lot of those. Uh, you could call them Portman 2s or um, what's the anthology films. Yeah. We've got coming up in a couple of weeks, Blood on Satan's Claw. But also there is a Vincent Price film where it's probably his most understated role that was Witchfinder General. Have you ever seen that? I have not. Okay. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, Vincent Price films. The director was really, really riding on Vincent Price quite a bit. And that really kind of made him dial it back a little bit and stop doing what Vincent Price does. And pretty much everybody else just let Vincent Price do whatever the hell he wants. Yeah, and, I mean, that would make sense. Right. And this particular director at the time didn't want to have the character be the typical Vincent Price character because he wasn't... Then why is why is Vincent Price to be in your movie? Because the producers put him in there. And it they were trying the, the director at the time, I guess, wanted Donald Pleasance. And it was a thing where they were kind of uh. fighting over it. But the end result, even Vincent Price said, you know, to the director afterwards that it's it's a fabulous work and it's one of his better roles, and he's really happy about it. Now, I always get Amicus and Tygon confused. Now, Amicus is another studio that they're the ones that did a lot of those uh anthology type movies, and that's who I was thinking of earlier. So that's oh, nice. Yeah, so I'm getting a lot of these confused. There was like a brief period in my late teens where a bunch of these films just came into my life all at once because of uh, digital cable and uh, stars. <laughs> <laughs> encore package because <laughs> they had a bunch of these older films so i never really paid attention to the makers but i remember the titles whenever i see them and yeah. so i'm still piecing this part of cinematic history together and i'm sure there's somebody out there that knows a hell of a lot more than us but that's not why you listen to this show you listen no. to this show to hear our hot takes on whether our, or not a grandma is fuckable we're getting ready to spit fire about whether or not these two old ladies can get down <laughs> and again it's the subject matter not necessarily the actors or actresses that are in the film yeah and no the subject matter is really fucking bumming me out <laughs> yeah it's like well no that was almost spoiler for the whole plot line i'm just gonna i'm just gonna pause i'm gonna drop yeah. back what i was gonna say and we're just gonna play the legion gofundme promo we're gonna have a little bit of music that i yanked right out of the film so everybody just be cool yeah just be cool motherfuckers you know how to be cool so be cool and when we come back we will have the trailer for beast in the cellar this is Bo from legionpodcasts.com Hey, it's been a crazy time, and when the world gets nuts, we're happy to offer some old-fashioned podcast entertainment. But for some folks, getting a laugh out of a show isn't really helping these days. People who depend on tips in their bartending jobs or have been put on furlough with no pay till the worst of this coronavirus threat has passed. That's a tough spot. That's why we set up a GoFundMe for members of our community, a sort of grand-scale take-a-penny-leave-a-penny. For people like myself, for whom the recent disruptions haven't kicked us out of work, well, we can drop a few of those extra pennies in the GoFundMe jar for those who are directly affected by recent events and find themselves looking for money to pay the electric bill or keep the water on. Well, how about you give me a shout at bo, B-O, at legionpodcasts.com. Let me know the situation and what you need, and we'll do our best to make life a little easier. And you can find links to the GoFundMe on the front page of legionpodcasts.com, on our Facebook group page, or on Twitter at Legion Podcasts, where it's the pinned tweet. For those of you who are able, thanks in advance for chipping in. And members of our community who need a hand, hey, here we are. Remember, stay safe, stay healthy, and we're all going to get through this together. Legion isn't just a name, it's who we are. Thanks for listening to all the shows here on Legion Podcasts, and we'll talk to you soon.
Okay, so while we're talking about things being foisted upon filmmakers having to do with uh, Tygon Studios, the score for this film, The Beast in the Cellar, was a contentious thing that the producer of the film didn't want, the director of the film didn't want, but there was some kind of a deal with the studio and some talent agency, so this composer and the music was foistered upon the film, and when the director demanded it to be changed and the main head of the studio or whoever said, no, it's not going to happen. The director told the studio to then take his contract and stick it up their ass. Jesus. Or whoever it was in the head of the studio. And then the guy was let go, obviously. And that was the end of his career with Tygon Studios. So a lot of contention in the score that I'm playing tonight. Keep that in mind. Whether you dislike it or enjoy it, it caused a man to end his career with Tygon. Wow. Then there you go. (laughs) But don't let that bring you down while you're listening to this trailer. Terror stalks the countryside and holds the community in a grip of fear. Well, I've never seen anything like this before. Never. Neither have I, Superintendent. Human, animal, or animal? Joyce, Joyce, he's gone! What is the sinister secret of the beast in the cellar? Oh, my God. Did they get anyone? Catch anyone? No, but someone saw a thing getting away. Thing? It was a girl who saw it. She thought it was an animal of some kind, but she couldn't really tell. Darkness cloaked the mystery and the shattering nightmare of the beast in the cellar. It's all right, Joyce. I've done it. I've done it. I've, I've buried him. And who have you been burying in the middle of the night? He can see us. He can see in the dark. Lily, get to the telephone. I can't. I can't. The Beast in the Cellar brings to the screen the chilling performances of two great ladies. Beryl Reed and Flora Robson. I've got to tell them now, Joyce. You do understand, don't you? I've, I've got to. If you think it's best, Ellie. Dare you go into the cellar and uncover its gruesome secret? Well, that was the entirety of the movie. I think we're done here. We're done. I'll talk to you guys later. Uh, so there you go. See it. <laughs> yeah, that was the beast uh, in the cellar. You guys don't even you really know? need to watch it. So yeah, you know what? Fuck it. We'll do it anyway. All right. Let's go find out who the beast in the fucking cellar is. Spoiler so, alert. Spoiler alert. It's Castle this- Freak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's actually a total remake of Castle Freak. It's just the way it goes. Only um, 20 some odd years or more years earlier. Bef- yeah, yeah, right. All right, first 20 minutes. So we see an army guy, his Jeep breaks down. He's like, well, I'm fucked. And uh, he calls in headquarters and like, yeah, we'll send out a unit. He goes, fine. He kind of is just going to camp there by the Jeep for the night. Just be like, fuck it, why not? Because, you know, hey, he's an army dude. Who gives a shit? And that night he is uh, attacked and killed by a some sort of a creature we see uh then it cuts to a young lady finds his body and she screams and like oh my god everything's fucking terrible because it is when you find a dead body and you're not court Um, (laughs) did i blink or was there no blood on screen during the attack and we didn't see the aftermath at all when the lady screams we're just supposed to play it off in our imagination right i I, yeah i I don't if there was any blood it was minimal it was really just the guy with a shock fit it's very much like uh the very first First Friday the Thirteenth and all the deaths in that, in which is just a person shocked fucking face. Not, Not all the deaths, but a few yeah. of them. Yeah, there was yeah. more blood in that. No, I think what you're going for is it's more like Psycho, where you see some blood, but mostly you don't actually see stabbing, and you see a lot less than what you think you do because there's yes. a lot of quick cuts. Only with Psycho, it was done properly. In this case, it was just kind of hackneyed together with that kind of jumpy editing, and I don't think it worked quite as well. Uh, you are correct. So, um, the cops then are investigating, and they believe it's some sort of, it looks like, some sort of large animal, cat-like animal. One even suggests a leopard, uh, which are, you know, last I checked, aren't indigenous to those areas, but... Well, no, that, that's not true. There is a rare really? deaf leopard that's indigenous to Britain. <laughs> you motherfucker. I cannot believe it. I was like, oh my god, I want to learn facts today. And no, just it's, you being an asshole. But it's technically, <laughs> it's technically a fact. It's a very rare deaf leopard. Unfortunately, they only have three limbs. 
limbs, though, not the traditional four. <laughs> it would be like seven, because I think there's four guys in there. <laughs> seven yeah, instead of eight. Yeah, limbs. I know. I was just going to go off the drummer, though. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, move on. All right, all right. Then we cut to an old uh, woman. She gets actually a phone call, uh, and she heads out of her house after getting the call. She seems pretty concerned. Um, she uh, meets with her sister, and that's our first long-ass there clip. There's no place for the groceries. Joyce, you frighten me. Why'd you go creeping about like that? It's bad for me. It's bad for my heart. I'm not creeping about. There's nothing the slightest bit wrong with your heart, as you very well know. Nothing whatsoever. You're as strong as a horse, although you like to pretend you're not. There is. You know there is. When I have a shock, I get this fluttery feeling as if my heart's going to stop beating altogether. I told Dr. Spencer about it only last week. That's right, Ellie. I know you told Dr. Spencer about it. And what did Dr. Spencer say? He said there was nothing to worry about. (laughs) But how does he know? It's my heart. Anyway, it's different sitting quietly, talking to him in the surgery. He's never examined me when I've had a shock. In any case, it doesn't alter the fact that the sitting room table is no place for the shopping. You forgot the celery. You know I can't eat cheese without celery. It's not as if it's the only shock I had this morning. No, indeed. Ellie, there's no celery. I put it on the list. There wasn't any. Mr. Trueblood said he hadn't got any. He went to the market this morning and he didn't care for the look of it. Not with his class of trade, he said. Everything must be tip-top. I don't think this winter will ever end. Summer's always so short. Winter goes on and on. Summer. Oh, I love the summer. Do you remember the first summer of the war when Daddy came home on leave? We went to the fair. I wonder where we can get some celery. You surprise me sometimes, Joyce. You really do. You behave as if you just don't care. What's the good of caring now? Somebody's got to be practical. What good does caring do? A bit of sentiment wouldn't do you any harm. Sentiment isn't going to run this house as well you know. Bitterness isn't either. And why shouldn't I be bitter? I've been away from here. Married. Probably with children of my own, if it hadn't been for them. Oh, yes, oh, yes, you can be sentimental when you like. I know you've had your chances, which is more than I ever did. Do you want to make the coffee or prepare the lunch? You can choose. I haven't told you my news, my, my first shock of this morning. It was awful. Terrible. It was a really terrible shock. I, I couldn't wait to get home to tell you. I know about it already. You know? You can't know. Mr. Trueblood told me in the shop not ten minutes ago. I ran all the way home to tell you about it. In spite of your bad heart, it's already all over town. Mrs. Trueblood, the greengrocer's wife, has run off with Mr. Pilkington, the ironmonger. Mrs. Trueblood, Mr. Pilkington, what on earth are you talking about? Mrs. Trueblood was in the shop when I left not ten minutes ago. Oh, maybe I got it wrong. Maybe it's Mr. Trueblood and Mrs. Pilkington. Yes, perhaps that's it. No, neither of them has run away with anyone. They were both in the shop together, large as life. And it was probably the fishmonger or somebody. Nobody's run away with anybody. Wish I knew who was spreading rumours like this. It's not good enough. Some people have got nothing better to do than gossip about other people. It's disgraceful. If only people would mind their own... Joyce, you're cruel. You've been making fun of me. Why are you always doing things like that? It's mean, especially when I've got something really important to tell you. Then tell me something really important. Well, it happened last night up near the army camp, though they didn't discover it till this morning. It's terrible. Nobody knows who did it, but Joyce, last night... At Littlemere, there was a murder. Really? Yes, really. A vicious, brutal slaying. That's what Mr. Trueblood said. A vicious, brutal slaying. How terrible. Who was it? Who was what? Who was brutally and viciously slain? A soldier, that's who. Private. Thank goodness it was a private. Ellie, what a thing to say. Thank goodness it was a private, indeed. They're human beings just like us. You surprise me. Well, I didn't mean it like that. You know I didn't. It's just that 
I hoped it wasn't a corporal, otherwise it might have been... Might have been your precious Alan. Is that what you were going to say? Yes. Yes, it was. Wouldn't like Alan to be slain. And neither would you come to that. You're just as fond of him as I am. Just that you don't like to admit it. Am I really? You know you are. He's been a godsend to us, one way and another. I'll go and make the coffee. Good. Then we can sit down and have a nice long chat about the murder. Did they catch whoever did it? I think we'll have snow. A storm. Wish it would come. But you hate storms. You always have. Why, you used to creep into my bed when there was a storm. At night, I hate storms. That's only at night. A nice storm in the daytime is something else again. Oh, this heaviness. It's not clear. I've got such a headache. Well, you are in a bad way. What with your heart and your head? I'm only human, you know, Joyce. I do have little ailments, just like other people from time to time. I'm sorry, Ellie. I think the weather's getting on my nerves, too. The murder going on just up the road and the two of us here like this. I haven't caught the murderer. No, not yet. It's probably one of the soldiers who got drunk and had a fight with another one. That's what Mr. Trueblood thinks. You know what they're like, the way they wake me up some nights, coming home to the camp, singing and shouting. Probably. Still, poor boy, he was very young. Nineteen. Nineteen? How do you know? Mr. Trueblood never told me that. You knew all the time. You've been pretending. I didn't want to upset you. You, you were pretending not to know. Why, Joyce? Why? I told you, you were so full of the news. I wanted you to have the pleasure of telling me yourself. Pleasure? Do you think it's a pleasure to know there's a murder at large? Prowling about in the garden at this very minute, perhaps? What sort of pleasure is that? Hush, Ellie. Stop getting in the state. They probably found him by now, sure to have done. <gasps> what on earth's the matter with you, Ellie? It's only the front doorbell. Go and answer it. You go. I'm not going. I'm not stirring out of this room. I expect it's only the baker. It's not his day. Oh, we wanted to an earth it was, Alan. Just thought I'd drop by, see how you were. Oh, we're fine, aren't we, Joyce? Fine. Just in time for coffee. I hoped I might be. I haven't had time to stop all morning. I suppose you've heard. About the murder, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we've heard. I just wanted you to know there's nothing to worry about. They've caught the murderer? No, not yet. But they will, Miss Ballantyne. Don't you worry about it. I've never seen so many police. Everywhere you look. Take my word for it. They'll catch him. Oh, thanks. They know who it is. Do they? Do they know who it is, Alan? Well, no. You see, I'm sort of right in on it. I've got the job of driving the pathologist around. Pathologist? Sir Bernard Newsmith. Yes, he came down from London by helicopter this morning. Helicopter? Fancy. Did you see the uh, body? Yes. Was it brutally and viciously slain? That's what Mr. Trueblood said. Brutally and viciously slain. Well, it... It was, really. I overheard Sir Bernard talking to the detective's boss, superintendent somebody. He said it might not have been a human being at all. What, the body? No, whatever killed him. He said it might be something else, uh, an animal of some sort. You mean he might have been gored by a bull in the dark? No, not a bull, nothing like that. You should have seen this detective's face. An animal, he said. Sir Bernard said, yeah. A puma, he said, something like that. No, he said... Not a puma, something bigger than that. Look at those marks made by talons. Well, what then, said this couple? What sort of an animal? A leopard. A leopard? I think maybe a leopard. Copper stares at him. A leopard, he says. A leopard in Lancashire. He said he couldn't be sure yet, for the detective not to hold him to it, but he thought it could be something like that anyway. Something with claws or talons. Anyway, I just thought I'd look in, tell you not to worry. 
They'll catch it soon enough, whatever it is. Oh, that was nice of you, Alan. Very thoughtful. Very. We hardly liked you to have a leopard come knocking at the door. Well, if you do, don't answer it. He'll go away soon enough. See Alan out, Ellie. Yes, Joyce. Well, don't trouble, Miss Ellie. I know the way by now. I'll look in again soon. And you're not to worry, either of you. OK? Bye. That was nice of him, wasn't it? Very. Rinse the coffee cups, Ellie. I'm going into the garden to see if I can find some odd, tired celery. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and there's only one more clip, so we're okay right now. Uh, <laughs> this is and basically the, way, the whole movie. It's people sitting around talking about the horrible things that have happened or are about yeah, to happen because dialogue is cheaper to film. It was a hard-ass movie to clip because of that, because where do you stop it? Well, so, <laughs> Yeah, and even if you are giving me a blow-by-blow, blow, you're still literally having to tell me everything that people are always talking about. Yeah, so, yeah, it's... <laughs> right. And I'm not saying that as a massive complaint. I'm just saying that a lot of this film is driven by the dialogue and you have to kind of infer things in your mind. And I think what they were going for is that good old fashioned ghost story creep out kind of thing where yeah. you think about it and the description is what makes you get scared. And sometimes that works for you and sometimes that doesn't. What it really hinges on is your concern and like of these two ladies. I'm assuming this is the end of the 20 minutes because the clip was fucking 20 fucking it, minutes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's the end of the 20 minutes. Yeah, so the so first that's, 20. that's why I'm yeah. getting into this now. Yes. So good if, job. If you enjoy both the actresses, which apparently they were extremely famous, I did not recognize either of them. I apologize. They could be famous British wise, so maybe we might not know. Right. Given the time frame, the 70s, this wasn't really my purview of yeah. time, other than like if maybe they were on Doctor Who, I'd recognize them for that. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe, but that's really sketchy for, you know, whether or not I'd recognize them there too. Uh, but so these two ladies were hired to be like the crux of the film like you know they were going to be following these are the stars right yeah. so if they work for you then the things that they're discussing and the sort of now it's not just castle freak here this is sort of almost like um a hag exploitation bit of movie where these two sisters are living together and they are uh kind of hinting at a darker turn in their lives that the one sister is somewhat uh, regressed she's kind of stuck in a certain childhood frame of mind about their father. Yeah, very and, much so. Yeah, and it kind of reminds me of like a whatever happened to baby Jane kind of thing, you know, where and the term hag exploitation is actually the term of the films. I know it's awful. I wish I didn't have hag. to use it. Hag exploitation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that was a thing that happened with, you know, whatever happened to baby Jane and those kinds of movies. Um, and it feels like this is mining that vein a little bit and then mixing it with the kind of story that Castle Freak went after. We already know something is trapped in their cellar you know yes. some kind of a creature that has somehow been getting out and harming people which is very lovecraftian so that aspect of it of a thing that is locked behind a bricked up wall you know we haven't seen that yet but you know this thing that's trapped in a cellar you know we know there's a beast in a cellar uh it, it, that kind of idea and then having these old ladies where something is off and you know something's not right and their discussion the longer that goes on in that 10 minutes which is why you took that clip the fucking more uncomfortable it becomes until they finally decide just to make lunch yeah it's just you feel like there's going to be a blow up like somebody is gonna blow up right and you don't right, know who right but during that conversation you're like which one of these two ladies is gonna fucking kill the other which one's gonna cane this able yeah 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 there you go no exactly yeah it, that's what we're waiting on and that's what that yep. conversation feels like and it's kind of boiling over because the one that's kind of more grown up and adult is really obviously tired of the regressed one's bullshit about their family and well, yeah they're really getting on each other's nerves but the one that's regressed seems really off and really out of touch with reality so is she gonna snap and do some killing that's where your brain's at. And I totally get that's why you did the clip. I totally get that. Yeah. It's just, it was like, uh, and then like, it really, there's nothing to get clippable until the very end of the movie. Because while this is dialogue driven, in the middle, there's also not a lot of dialogue. That, that like sustained dialogue. Yeah, the pace of this film is very deliberate. Like, they take their time, and they bring you in slowly, and they try to get you to sort of, like, ease into things. But if you pay attention to the things that these old ladies are actually talking about, it, you should already be unsettled and be like, what the fuck is wrong with these two? Yeah, they seem very... It's very unnerved being in that house. So. It's, it's like the fucking Clopex in England, basically. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so the next 20 minutes then starts, uh, Joyce says she's going to go look for celery in the garden. Um, but really she goes and she opens up the closet and see, we see an old soldier's uniform that she's really gripping to like a little unhealthy. It seems a little unhealthy to me. It's uh kind of sexual. Yeah. Like really fucking gyrate half- weird yeah uncomfortable yep. creeped out and if you're into that sort of thing hot yeah yeah well <laughs> right <laughs> And if you're into that sort of thing, you're having yourself a day. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't um, think the age of the person doing this, like if they were young and hot, I don't think it would make it any less weird no, and it, uncomfortable. Well, I mean, it, it did context. Is it a woman like or a man gripping their loved one's uniform who just died? Then you'd be like, OK, well, shit happens. But grief this, does weird things to a person. But this is downright. Yeah, this is downright. It's different. This is very different different than just it's, grief. It's borderline pathological on the need to have grief counseling because that might be somewhat unhealthy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um but you know, everyone's fine. We're all fine here. Everyone's fine. <laughs> everyone's uh, fine except for whoever slow fucking humping that uniform. Well, then her and Ellie have a bit of an argument about their father. Ellie is sort of romanticizing their dad, uh, at least how he was before the war. Apparently, he was nice, dashing. They have a painting of him up on the wall. Um, This is that regressed childhood, my daddy so perfect thing I was kind of alluding to earlier in the last 20 minutes. And then Joyce brings up, she goes, you know, he wasn't the same. And, you know, you need to let this go, right? And and, And Ellie does admit, she goes, goes, yeah, of course, after the war, he was never the same. But before the war, you know, she's just, she's, she is really hunkering down on this pre-war dad that apparently got all his shit rocked in the, uh, it, after the war and i'm assuming world war one yeah dad. it's world war uh, one and there's something that we kind of need to discuss here this whole thing about their dad was changed is it alluded to that he was physically injured or is it emotional ptsd type of, of an injury that turned him into something that was unlivable for these two little girls who were scared by him or horrified yeah. by him or was he harmed in such a way that you know he wasn't even able to take care of himself the film doesn't tell you all you know is is whoever he was before he went to war was destroyed enough that the two little girls are too horrified even to talk about it into their later years as older women. Yeah. Um, so you you get fairly concerned by uh, kind of what Ellie's talking about. So then Joy says, you know, she's getting a really bad headache and she wants to go lay down. Um, so uh, she goes to have a lay down. Then we see another soldier and his lady friend are going into some barn and and it looks like they're about to get down. The lady friend is all concerned. She hears something. And, you know, the soldier's like, you always hear something. Uh, <laughs> it's it, it's kind of messed up. Uh, uh, like, he, hey, gets, he gets a little forceful and yeah. acting like he is deserving of access to her body. But at the same time, she does end up going right back into oh, being then with she's him. Like, she's like, just tell me you love me. And then they, you know, they go at it. So Yeah, we uh, kind of see a nipple for a second during yeah, some of this. Yeah, you really think maybe something's coming. But uh, unfortunately, that uh, that doesn't happen because they are attacked. And uh, Oh, that's right. For you, if blood splashes on it it doesn't count but they show a tit they show an actual tit they and blood do show a tit it. yeah so they they show a tit but yeah a blood, blood spattered boobs, on it blood spattered boobs work for me so yeah <laughs> she's screaming and uh then we cut to we see joyce wakes up and she comes down to uh, and ellie's making a salad and, and we see that ellie's like i don't know you must not have checked the garden the right way she goes because i found some uh some celery to use so they're making it uh some and after after talking about the uh, the leopard, which they all think maybe the, what the killer is, you know, is it a leopard, whatever. Um, Joyce is very concerned. We see she's kind of staring off into space. and She says that we should probably cancel the afternoon walk, which really hurts Ellie because they always take an afternoon walk. But then Ellie's like, oh, of course, until they find the leopard. And Ellie's kind of going about her world like nothing's wrong, where Joyce is very concerned about something. People don't act like this in real life. People get genuinely concerned about the safety of others around them whenever bad things hi yeah yeah well, i'm sorry are you all right over there <laughs> you yeah just, uh, yeah you hit that brick wall of realization about what people are actually well not even this yeah, uh, what about uh, uh, most american people are like 
Uh, it's just, it's everywhere. Fuck. Yeah. So, um, uh, then we see another soldier, he's riding a bike, and he gets attacked, uh, by a creature, or whatever, because we're in first person mode. This thing, uh, whatever it is, the beast in the cellar. Yes. Then we see the two ladies are preparing a bowl of some sort of substance, and they are putting what appears to be sedatives in it. They state they're going to need more from the doctor, but Ellie says that the doctor was already concerned with how much Joyce was taking, and that she shouldn't need this much. And Joyce says not to worry, he'll, she'll just say she's having even more trouble sleeping they'll get the higher dosage they need so that's just weird yeah they're and, drugging somebody's food but we don't yeah. know who <laughs> exactly then l ellie she takes the food away and joyce goes up to a painting of their father and she's like that to tell me i'm right to do this dad i was right to do this saying something like that which is fucking just already weird um yeah the more you think about the shit that you're seeing on screen like just talking about it this is way way more effective of a horror movie than when I was first experiencing it because I wasn't thinking about all this stuff. I was just trying to take yeah. it in. The it, more I you mean, think about it, the more fucked up it gets. I'm already unnerved. I'm, I'm very <laughs> unnerved. And yeah. the more the more Joyce does things. See, I was never too bad with uh, Ellie. But besides thinking that, okay, you have, you know, some, you, you think you had some growing up problems. And, and when I mean that, I mean like she didn't grow up. But Joyce is the one that really is just somewhat just eerie to me. And um, I wouldn't trust yeah. being left alone with either of them or both of them. Right. Then L runs up and says that he's gone. They go down to check and they have this stone wall in their cellar with a little hole in it. They look through and they can't see anything except for some dead rats. And Joyce says, no, he's over there in the corner. And then L says, don't flash the light at him. He doesn't like that the poor thing. Um, as they're trying to look maybe into it more, the bell rings. Alan shows up with their meat delivery, even noting that they eat a lot of meat for just two old ladies. He informs them that there's been another attack and a girl saw it all. They were like, well, she, the girl wasn't attacked? He goes, no, only the soldier. And, but she's in shock and so she doesn't know exactly what she saw. Um... He's stating that now they're upping security and he's going to have to patrol at their home every so often to make sure things are okay with them. Ellie is now convinced that he has gotten out. They look for a way he could have gotten out and they find um, the bike uh, that the last soldier was riding. They're like, well, where is this? Um, there, there's some more looking here. Uh, and then they find a hole he used to escape in a shed, like where the exit was, where he got out of. And then also there they find a soldier's dead body with his eye all popped out which is pretty cool yeah that the was shadows the effect was really decent for the time and it's one of those things where they're like okay you've been super patient here you go you fucking gore hounds here's a little yeah. treat you know here's a here's a little something for you now don't say we didn't give you anything right and we're talking 1970 71 depending upon which website you believe is the year of release i'm just gonna go with 1970 because that's the soonest and it was pretty envelope pushing for a 1970s british film too as far as yeah. i'm concerned i agree yeah it wasn't bad at all. They have a government sanctioned rating system that you will abide by, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you will abide. Right. So, they are pushing the envelope for this time. Yeah. So, what they decide to do is they push a table into the hole and they block the hole. But at this point, Juice hurts herself. Seems like she probably twists her ankle pretty bad. And that ends that 20 minutes. So, Elle's now, or Joyce is hurt, but they're convinced whatever's down there has gotten out. Um, and it's they found pretty the way obvious that. Out. It's yeah. pretty obvious that they have put this thing down there or someone in this family has, and they're just up keeping whatever this is and feeding it and trying to keep it from getting to escape. But it dug its way out, and that's just horrific. How long did that take? Exactly. And um, and a pretty good hole that it dug. So, Jesus. Yeah, this thing um, must be huge, whatever it is. Christ. Yeah. Yep. So then, uh, we, you know, we start with some more of the bad shit here. And uh, uh, so the next 20 begins, L uh, gets Joyce back to the house and calls the doctor. Uh, the doctor comes to visit, and he wants Joyce to go to the hospital, but they convince him, both of them, that she should stay there. He says, fine, but then he's sending a nurse to check on him twice a day, which they're not happy about, but they're going to have to accept. Elle is ke Ellie keeps wants to call the cops, but Joyce makes a, her promise not to call the cops and then tells her there's a spade in the shed so that, you know, they can bury the body of the soldier they found. That wow. night, yeah, right? Fucking cold-blooded. Cold-blooded! 
Um, that night, as uh, Ellie is trying to, she she grabs the body, and when she does, she pushes his eyeball back in his head. Did you see that? Yeah, that was pretty cool. That, that was fucking gnarly. I love that. Yeah, that and, was another little gorehound treat for you, because you've been yeah. this patient. Yep, yeah, right. Um, so, as she does this, then we see this young nurse. She drives up on her bike and trying to find, she knocks, but no one answers, of course. She's trying to find her way into the building, um, and, uh... You know, no one's really uh, getting a hold of her. So, uh, and as she kind of goes looking around, we see Ellie's, like, digging this grave for the body and all that. And we get a little, now you get that concern. Is the nurse going to find her digging the body? What, what will Ellie, you know, do then? What, what are we going to, what's going to happen? Yeah, like we were talking about Hitchcock earlier with Psycho. This is the part where Norman Bates would be pushing the car into the water. Into the water, it, it, right as somebody's driving up or something. Right, like that's um, that's the kind of tension that they're building here, and I think this is probably the highlight of the film. What they do here with ratcheting up the tension and everything, this yeah, is probably this their is, best work with editing and music and everything. Agreed. This is a really tension filled. A lot of it. It it, it does not. It if this is something they did for padding, this is how you do padding and build suspense at the same time for your movie. This is how you do it. Because we've seen so many movies that don't know how to do it. This is how you do it. Because they did a really good job of of turning that around yeah. on everybody. It, it can't be padding if it actually works and builds suspense and keeps ratcheting things up in the story. So I would say yeah. that it's definitely it's not, it's, well it's done. It's not padding, but yeah, so many other people try to do this and it turns into padding. There right. we go. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's a better way of putting it. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, and uh, so anyway... Um, we then see uh, Joyce is in her bed. She's sweating. She's obviously injured. And uh, the nurse comes looking, walking in. She, you know, starts to take her temperature, saying she had, sorry, she had knocked, but she had to crawl through a window. So then she goes to the washroom to wash her hands, and Al walks in without knowing she's there and tells Joyce that, that it's bur- she's buried him and everything's fine. The nurse walks in right away and says, who did you bury? One of your animals? You know, almost just giving him a out <laughs> yeah that was pretty funny yeah yeah <laughs> she's like yeah 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 one of my animals we had to bury it just then alan comes over he uh l says wow you have a gun on you and he goes yeah we're, all officers have to at least have a sidearm now because of the dangers going on which makes sense kind of interesting that their military over there doesn't carry weaponry normally mm-hmm. you do their police officers normally yeah yeah normally they don't he offers to drive the nurse home and which she graciously accepts and you know because you know she's a young pretty nurse and he's a strapping young lad so what the hell um so uh then we see two army guys they're out on patrol and one has run out of cigarettes and he the other one says just go run into the bar real quick go buy a pack of cigarettes um or else you're going to be complaining you know the rest of the night and he takes the other gun and you know and he goes runs in he buys the cigarettes he comes back out he's looking for his buddy and as he lights a cigarette he gets attacked from above uh then we cut to the next day the doctor comes by uh, with the nurse to check on joy she is still asleep after the dose of medicine she was given and it's weird she says that that amount of the sed- uh, the sedation they gave her the the sedative they gave her shouldn't be acting like this uh it shouldn't have her out this low he goes but it's it should be fine because this is what they've given her before this is you know this is the same dosage so that's you know backfired on her now (laughs) lying yeah, about yeah, yeah she's that. she's been administered a le- well a nearly lethal for her dosage i would say where it's yeah. put her into a coma almost <laughs> but the doctor says not to worry about it it's probably from the trauma of everything that's happened and her injury and let her sleep she could use it um so uh then uh the doc leaves and the nurse and ellie talk and the nurse tells ellie about another murder that's taken place that they found another victim and and this really disturbs Ellie. And the nurse offers to stay, but Ellie needs to check on some stuff. So she kindly, you know, gets the nurse out of there. And, uh, and that ends that 20 minutes of that film, a part of the film. So now things are starting to take shape. Everything's a bit more dangerous right now. <laughs> yeah. And there is tension being ratcheted up because one of the sisters was injured. And now she needs a nurse. The yeah. nurse came to visit and let herself in through a window when no one 
unanswered because she needs to be there to take care of her patient. That seems a bit overzealous, but I'll go with it. <laughs> and um, now they're trying to bury a dead soldier that was left behind by this beast that keeps returning to their cellar. Am I to believe that, or is it just the roaming loose? Now? I think it's just roaming loose. Yeah, so they covered up the hole and they made it so it couldn't return, basically. Yeah, or, <laughs> well, or it is returning and he was in there, but yeah, he figured, I think they actually say he figured out a way out later. So that's, not, either way, it's not good. Either way, something's on the loose. Right, um, and, and there was another attack and then that they found, and then this guy that they're burying, I'm guessing, makes a third already? Yes, so now there's a, uh, there's all new problems happening for, for these people. Yeah, things are getting we, much worse. Uh, Ellie goes looking again, and she finds, uh, again, she really shines a light in there, and yes, the the prison room, if you were in their cellar, is completely empty. Um, so then she goes, she checks the shed where the hole is, and the bench has been moved. So he was in there and just was able to move the bench and get out. So, damn, sorry about your luck, I guess. Um, <laughs> you know, fucked. Yeah, and you're hoping that it is some kind of an animal that they were keeping in there. But then again, you're like, they've been drugging it with human drugs. They've been feeding it some kind of a slop that they're making. Like, you just really don't want it to be human, but at the same time, you don't want it to be an animal either. You, <laughs> you just are like, what the fuck? This is abuse. This is horrible. This thing's never seen sunlight. Yes. It all Everything's bad here. Uh, there's nothing good. Everything's bad. Uh <laughs> So, um, El Den tries, Ellie, she tries to go up and tell Joyce, but Joyce is high as a kite. And then even kind of says something like, are you still scared for your poor little, you know, soldier boy? You know, and, and she's just higher than shit. And she's like, maybe we all deserve this, all this kind of stuff. So, uh, Joyce is at a point of no return as drugged as she is right now. So she's feeling no pain, but she's yeah. feeling all sorts of guilt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not good for her. Uh, but it's probably what she does kind of deserve if, you know, <laughs> at the end of this movie. <laughs> we Knowing what we already know, we are going to say, yes, she deserves everything that's happening in Morse. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, uh, then, um, uh, El makes, uh, Ellie makes a phone call and she has to make an executive decision here. Uh, she says, sorry to Joyce and Ellie calls the police. So the police come around now, uh, you know, after realizing kind of how dangerous everything is, uh, they are all there and they start knocking down the wall of where the, you know, the, the cellar prison. Um, and then they let some dogs in there, some sniffer dogs, and then the dog go through the hole and come out the other side with the shed. The cops meet them there. So now the dogs have whatever it is scent. <laughs> yeah, whatever this beast of the cellar is, they have the beast's scent. Yes. So, you know, there you go. Um. Uh, so then the... Uh, so then uh, the police start questioning Ellie, and she tells the officer about their dad, who was so super awesome and everything, and he went to World War One, and everything was fine, Um, but then when he came home, apparently he was gassed, so when he came home, he was very different looking and very scarred, so much so in the recollection, uh, I believe it was Joyce took one look at her father and screamed and ran away. So it's physical um, dismemberment, apparently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was he just was looked bad. Then, um, somehow she tells the story that her mom got pregnant with a brother that they called Steve. How that happens, I don't know. But that leads to our final long clip. And in 1921, mother told us she was expecting another baby. I don't know why, but we were rather shocked somehow. Father being like he was. Anyway, Mother had Stephen. He was a beautiful baby. Joyce and I adored him. But Father didn't take to him at all. Mother wasn't well after that, and Father got worse and worse all the time. He wouldn't have Stephen in the same room with him. And then Mother died. She hadn't been well, you see, since Stephen was born. Father hated him even more after that. And one day he started to brick up the cellar. He said he was going to put Stephen in there. Let him rot, he said. But of course, Joyce and I stopped him. And it turned out that Stephen was strange in some way, did it? Oh, no, not at all. 
He was a very intelligent child, very bright. Father was a bit better after he'd gone away to boarding school, but he never spoke about him. He, Stephen wrote him letters. He, he never opened them. He just threw them on the fire without a word. Of course, we didn't tell Stephen that. And so he just kept on writing. If he asked, we said that father enjoyed his letters, but that he never wrote back to anybody. And then it must have been in 1933, Daddy died. Well, he'd been in bed for over a year, so none of us missed him very much. We were quite glad, really, because we'd realised long ago that he would never get any better. So we thought this was probably the best thing. How did Stephen take it? He was heartbroken, as if he and father had been everything to each other. Joyce and I could never understand it. That was in 1933? Yes, we started reading the newspapers then about Hitler and Germany. One crisis after another, it seemed to us. Where was Stephen then? Oh, he was still at boarding school. But Joyce said that he should come home and go to day school. She said we needed a man about the house. But there was only one big row. Stephen wanted to join the OTC at school, but Joyce put her foot down firmly over that. She wrote to the headmaster and said she wouldn't allow it under any circumstances. Stephen was furious, but Joyce was adamant. You see, Stephen, I just wanted to look after you, make sure you were safe. After all, I brought you up since you were a baby. I'd been mother and father to you. And all you wanted to do was get away from me. Go to the war. You do understand I couldn't let you do that, don't you? You were all I had, all I'd ever had. I had to keep you. You were everything to me. Ellie was there all the time, but it was you I wanted, Stephen. That was all. He took a job that summer. He said that if he earned some money, he could help us to manage. And that he could buy his own clothes when he went to university. It was only a casual job, mind you. And what happened after the summer? One day, Joyce said there was going to be another war. I was sure she was right. All the papers seemed to be full of it. Joyce said there would be conscription straight away this time. Everybody who was 18 would be called up and made to go and fight in France. She kept on and on about it, about Stephen and what had happened to Daddy and about how she'd never let it happen to Stephen. Never, never. Well, Stephen came across from Blackpool one Sunday afternoon. She said she wanted him to go to Canada about how much better the universities were there. But Stephen wouldn't go. He was determined not to go. He even said that if there was a war, he, he wouldn't wait to be conscripted. He'd join up. He said that if Joyce had let him join the OTC at school, he'd have been able to be an officer straight away. But that he didn't care. He'd join up and try and get a commission afterwards. But when he'd gone back to Blackpool, Joyce was out of her mind. She, she couldn't leave it alone. She went on and on about what had happened to Daddy and how we couldn't let the same thing happen to Stephen. She swore she wouldn't and she said that I should feel the same. Stephen only wanted to be an officer, like his father. Exactly. Funny, I'd never thought of it like that, but that's what it amounted to. Then one day, Joyce told me that she had a plan. She talked and talked about it all through the following week. She said that it wouldn't be difficult, that we could do it, that it would be better for Stephen. Eventually, I had to agree. Joyce was always stronger about things than I was. She went to the doctor and told him she couldn't sleep. He said it was her nerves and gave her some tablets. Well, she wrote to Stephen and told him to come over on Sunday. Said that she wanted to talk to him. 
She made tea, and not long afterwards, Stephen fell asleep in his chair. She put four tablets in his tea. The doctor said she must never have more than one. I was terrified, but she said everything would be all right, and we we took him down to the cellar. We had everything ready. All the stuff was there because Father had started on it ages ago when he was angry with Stephen. You ripped him up in the cellar. Yes. We both thought it was best for him. You you kept him there. For how long? Well, at first he used to shout and scream, but if it was especially bad or we thought someone was going to call, we just gave him some tablets and a drink or something. He he had to drink, you see. Well, they had to be stronger and stronger as time went on. But gradually he stopped making any noise at all. He just whimper now and again. It was very difficult during the war with only two rations for three people. And you kept him there right through the war? Yes, of course. And when it was over? That was the awful part. We, we couldn't let him out then. He was too far gone. He wasn't normal. He's been in there nearly 30 years. We thought it was best for him, you see. That's what we thought. He should have slapped fucking cuffs on her the minute that story was finished. Right? I mean, instead he just leaves. She'll ask what will be done with him. He doesn't really know, especially with this story that he's just heard. But yeah, I mean, holy shit. Yeah, it's so false imprisonment to stop him, and kidnapping and... To stop him from ruining his life, they ruined his life. Well, yeah, and to stop their father from destroying him and turning him into less than human because his they, father was pissed that his mother cheated on him and yeah. got pregnant from another man or who knows how many other men she slept with. But clearly she had gotten pregnant by not having sex with him and the girls obviously couldn't figure that out, which is yeah. why he hated the son. And El- Ellie still can't figure it out. Yeah, Ellie still doesn't know, but it's pretty fucking obvious in the way she's describing it. He was going to brick him up, but they thought that was too horrible a fate. But then they just go ahead and brick him up themselves rather than let him die in a war. At least this way they know he's still alive. This is fucking horrific. This is abuse. This is insanity. This is so fucking just out there that they thought this was okay. And during that, you also heard Joyce talking to Steven. That is happening in real time, not a passing. She got out, out of her bed and she still not doing very well put on the army uniform that she was hugging the whole time and was it was talking to him at that point yeah so they, later on that night joyce comes walking back in and l gets ellie gets her back to her bed um Alan comes by and uh, the nurse has said she's given something to Ellie to help her sleep. And they kind of, they're talking about what will happen to him. And Alan's like, "Ah, I just think they should just stay here um, where all their stuff is. He goes, there's two old ladies. They're obviously not going to be put in prison. So um, Alan's under the belief that they should just live out the rest of their days in their home with the knowledge of what they've done. Yeah. No, they need to fucking go on trial. If they get put on house arrest for some kind of compassionate release, fine. But still, they need to be held accountable exactly well there's a horrible storm that night and so alan says there are two other guards walking around the house let me give you a ride home again because the nurse only rode her bike well later on that night ellie storms into joyce's room because of the storm because again she hates storms at night just then steven comes in a wild long haired long beard you know huge fucking thick glass like fingernails yeah and and he crazed eyes and pale body runs in he kind of goes after joyce a little bit and when he's on the bed with Joyce, he's not really attacking her, but he sees the medals on her army coat and he gets afraid. Just then, uh, Alan walks in and shoots Stephen. Um, as as Stephen kind of lays there dying, but still has life in him, Ellie notices all she was actually going after was their father's picture because of how much she loved her father. So they give him the picture, and with his last dying breath, he does nothing but uh, tears it to pieces, uh, showing that. 
he knew that his father did not like him. That Again, I believe that was something Ellie created in her own mind to help with family stuff. I don't believe he ever cared for his father uh, at all. And as he tears away, everyone lays there and roll credits. Yeah, I don't care how fucking old they are. It really fucking made me mad when that guy was like, yeah, we'll just let him go. What's the big deal? Yeah, or or they'll probably just let him go. I mean, how the cop wasn't arresting them both right the fuck there. Yeah, because they're just these two sweet older ladies that were torturing a man for the entirety of his fucking life. Yeah, just so he wouldn't go to war. I mean, Jesus Christ. It's fucked up. It's really uh, fucked up. Yeah, I mean, holy fuck. This movie doesn't give you a pause about, I mean... Holy shit. Well, that's... I mean, in the in the flashback they have of him having coffee when he's when he gets drugged by his sisters and looking like a normal human being, it breaks your heart even more when you get to see him how he looked right before they stole his entire fucking life away from him. And we do see some glimpses of him running like kind of on all fours, and he does move very cat like. They did capture that and make yeah. that recreated really well. I don't know if they did that slower and then sped up the film or how they made that work, but it was very creepy and it was. Was very animalistic and i can see where people would think maybe it's some kind of large cat also with his nails and the clawing yeah I mean. yeah that as well and the nails really look like they could have been growing off of a human being but they looked really solid like he was being fed nothing but like proteins yeah <laughs> and carotene for his nails probably true. i mean alan did when he said he brought it in their meat order he was like wow you guys eat a lot you know yeah i mean they set the stuff up they deliver it off really really well the story really just kicks you in the fucking nuts but doesn't pull its foot away well it, no okay it kicks you in the genitals but doesn't pull his foot away <laughs> and it well feels it does pull its foot away just to kick you in the genitals again <laughs> and then the second time it grinds its heel a little on you when they finally do the big reveal of what happened and it's all explained for you and it's just yeah. horrific and it really really is quite effective and the more you think about this shit the more time you spend like really considering like how many years they've been doing this how long this has been going on 30 years yeah, he was locked up. Yeah, and when you really think about that amount of time with nothing to do sitting in a dark, bricked up room being constantly drugged so you're in and out of consciousness, not even knowing when you're really there or not, no wonder he be- turned so fucking mad, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and all you see of the outside world is a hole. I mean... Not even a hole, it was a it, fucking hole in a brick wall in a basement, yeah, so you only get to see the you, light from the basement. From a, And usually no light. It's The flashlight hurt his eyes. I mean, Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah, it's pretty horrific. <laughs> it's one of those fears of people you know, getting put in a brick wall, you know, alive, and then you just sit there. It's probably ten times worse, because at least then you know the sweet release of death will finally get you. Well, when you but starve to, to death be, or you lose all yeah. your water because you're bricked but in the wall. F- forced to live yeah Fuck. yeah and you know being maintained in that state it's like an like an, and just being drugged all the time so you're literally just in and out of consciousness that's horrific it's really terrifying uh-huh. to think about and that's the thing that this movie does really really well it goes with one concept it slowly builds to it it deliberately paces its way through and then when it finally starts going it just snowballs to the end of this big reveal and then it takes a breath to explain to you everything that's happened and what's really going on and somehow instead of making it feel like just the kind of thing that happened at the end of Psycho where the doctor tells you everything you need to know which makes it less scary the more you know about everything and what caused the person to become the beast in the cellar it becomes that much more horrifying <laughs> yeah yeah it's really well done <laughs> it's, a, it's a no thank you no thanks ma'am no thank you yeah i was really pleasantly surprised this was another one of those films that i bought just specifically because it filled in an order it, it was like a package deal that i wanted something that was the only way to get it and i was like fuck it it's worth it and this was another one of those pleasant surprises man and i'm really happy with beast in the cell uh, you should be i mean it's a great sus- it's a real suspense film a real one yeah you know yeah so many movies claim to be a suspense film and they're they're not <laughs> so this is real suspense this is how you build real suspense with serious horror elements thrown in that really yeah. push the envelope for its time yeah yeah exactly yeah i think we've summed it up well and we've got plenty of time to do some psy up news so let's take that yeah. break we'll play the promo from geek radio daily and we'll have a little bit more music that i yanked right out of the film we come back we'll do some psy up news are you having trouble keeping up with the ebbs and flows of modern geekery Is the real world holding you back from knowing what is happening in the geeky world? 
to answer these and other personal problems brought in by your friends, gaming group, and loved ones, Geek Radio Daily presents daily informational sessions brought to you by the wonderful Billy Flynn, the Flynnstress, and podcasting's Rich Siegfried. They contain such helpful segments as history, geek birthdays, box office results, the latest in DVD and Blu-ray, video game and comic releases. Why, they also have a weekly show hosted by the wonderful Billy Flynn and the Flynnstress, which includes interviews and commentary. And to make sure you are informed, Geek Radio Daily also provides you with your daily dose of geek news to make sure you know more than that jerk know-it-all Steve. Visit us at geekradiodaily.com. That's right, Geek Radio Daily. All the geek without the weight. Now available in fine Corinthian leather. bit of the music that they were having a problem with and that they didn't like possibly i don't know they didn't really quite go with anything else yeah that was a bit odd and off-putting and kind of uncomfortable and i don't know what would have been put over top of that but let's just shake that all off and give me some psyops Uh, this comes from Villa Wolf. All right. Uh, two California megachurches rebranded as strip clubs to defy government lockdown orders. Shut up. Are you talking about penises? Yeah, about right now. I'm trying to. Ooh, is that um, me getting a metal rod shoved up my rectum? The pastors of two California churches did a family-friendly strip tease in their Sunday services. Well, now I'm already bored by this article. Put it in the uh, butt. <laughs> removing their ties to mock the state's shutdown of churches while allowing adult establishments to re- made open. I mean, yes, we're looking for titties, but we want those titties wrapped in a heavy plot. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, maybe also a mask, because, you know, come on. Oh my um, god, just fucking incest already. <laughs> um, Pastor Jurgen Mathesis of Awakened Church in San Diego posted a video on Instagram of him taking off his tie in front of his congregation. I'm not kink-shaming you on your death fetish. Yes, you usually are. Well, actually, you wouldn't. That's actually more what I would do. You you definitely do not kink-shame on death fetishes. Oh, that blowjobs is... should be teethy, is what the priest no, I, says. I, yeah, 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 that's probably what the priests believe, yeah. Oh, blowjobs should be teethy. I mean, it seems messed up to say that, but, I mean, whatever. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, he states that strip clubs are exempt from COVID lockdowns and are deemed essential by our governor. So we're going to uh, be pushing the Christian agenda right down his fucking throat. He also states, so he decided that, uh, we are now awakened family friendly strip club is what he said. Hey fuckers, uh, religious bullshit. God's not real. Where they strip the devil of his hold power and authority over people's lives. With a club? With the, with, Yeah. I, I don't know. This is um, fucking some of the dumbest horseshit Christianity has pulled in a long time. Are you sure? Because, I mean, they've pulled some really dumb horseshit before. Pastor <laughs> Rob McCoy of Godspeak Calvary Chapel. I so mean, we're be how much? The Christian agenda right down your fucking throat. More of a toxic masculinity thing can you have other than calling your church the Godspeak Calvary Chapel? I mean, these are all those fucking churches that would probably be like in a fucking strip mall or that are in the movie theaters early Sunday morning before the theaters actually open. Uh, and so I, I, I denounce their abilities to preach. Um, <laughs> yeah, none of anyway. those people are listening to this show. I was like, hey there, don't offend them. But then I'm like, yeah, yeah no, they're, they're, not right. listening to this. they're not listening to this show. So anyway, uh, he says, uh, he's also in a, th- he's in a thousand oaks. He had a similar strip tease where he removed his tie in a no- November 22nd service before blasting the government and calling Christians to preach the gospel, but defying government tyranny and contending 
for their neighbors' livelihoods in the public square. My uh, in, 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 in the public cure square. For cancer. Do they not understand that? Okay, strip clubs are saying they remain open because people, you know, who need to actually pay taxes and shit can make money, whereas these ass fucks don't have to do shit or probably super rich anyway and don't have to pay taxes on anything they fucking do. I don't think strip clubs should really be open either or be considered essential, but I don't feel like churches should be open either. I mean, like I mean, at least with a strip club, everybody could mask up still and stay yeah. open. Uh, with you a know church, what, though, you sing and interact. Maybe it's not so much the club. I I, I was thinking more of those uh, strip drive through things we did stories on early on the, the virus. Yeah, they're adapting, you know? they're improvising, and they're overcoming. The mega churches aren't doing that. They're just hauling everybody no. in and having them sing hallelujah because, glory to God and fucking getting each other, other killed by f- spreading infections faster. Because uh, because it's not about preaching about God. If it was about preaching about God, they would just do virtual fucking shit or tell their people to. Yeah, it's about they would do it virtually. tithe by guilting them in person. I know. Yeah, that. but, but you can't. You can't get money in the collection plate on a virtual thing. You probably could if they opened up a virtual fucking cash app and took that fucking shit in. But I don't know how like the rules work on that. But I'm they're being guessing fucked. That, I'm guessing that it's not able to be tax free and they don't want to pay the service charge for that, which is why they're pushing for in-person services. Isn't that fucking just horrendous? I mean, it, it, oh my fucking God, I fucking hate people. I really do. Yeah, I just... yeah, Matt, we get it. Churches are a big fucking business and all they're selling is your fucking guilt and pay to feel better about it. We get it. <laughs> well, I'm just fucking still mad about it. All so kinds anyway, of things you don't want on your dick. Hey, fuckers, <laughs> religion's bullshit. God's not real. Praying to God. That's what assholes do. If you pray, you're an asshole. <laughs> yeah, and apparently you're a fucking rube who's going to fucking die so that your church can get your tithe out of you every fucking week until you do. Yes. He states you're contending for the welfare and the concerns and livelihood of your neighbor, said McCoy. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Those that are abused are being quarantined with their abusers. The elderly are lonely and isolated for no reason. No one gets to a the funerals of their loved ones. It's our responsibility to support folks. We are finished with your tyranny. I'm finished with your horseshit. And if I ever see you in the street, hey, watch I it, watch will, it, watch it. You can't say that shit. I will say mean things to you. There you go. You will verbally accost them. I will verbally accost you. All right. I will verbally accost you. Back it up a little bit and chill the fuck out here. All right. Sorry. Everybody, I get, I get, I, I, get, I see red when I see this shit. Right. <laughs> Everybody gets it. Everybody gets it. This guy is lumping a list of stuff together, right? Like my jello, my pudding, the fact that my fucking vinegar syndrome order is still waiting in a FedEx depot and hasn't been picked up yet because the COVID vaccines are taking precedence over everything else. If it weren't for this pandemic, I would have Beastmaster on 4K UHD disc at my house right now. What does all of this have to do with your tithe money? Absolutely nothing other than that I fucking need it so that I can pay for this shit and then maybe it'll show up on time on Christmas. I'm caring about your health and your well-being because my universal... (laughs) Horror box set <laughs> is fucking locked away in a vault somewhere that I can't get to because of the pandemic. You see what's happening here? I can't afford this. I can't afford that. Bring me your fucking tithe. Just die so I can have your money. I don't fucking care about you. That's all this guy is saying, but he's just listing off a bunch of random shit that has nothing to do with the fact that he wants the tithe money other than he can't afford anything without it. <laughs> well, McCoy and his church have faced numerous penalties for ignoring government orders in recent months. Earlier this month, a California judge ruled that strip clubs have a First Amendment right to reopen, while churches are forced to remain closed. In response, former Arkansas Governor Mike Huckabee said the, said on Fox News that churches should reopen as temporary strip clubs. Uh, he stated that um, churches should announce their pastor will remove his tie during the sermon, and therefore he will take off an article of clothing, making it temporary strip club so that people will be able to go to church, said Huckabee. So, you know, if Mike Huckabee's backing you, um, you're an asshole. Okay, that's, yeah, I got no fucking yeah. argument. I, can we just finish this up? Because it's just fucking depressing that's it. me. That's, that's, the, that's the end of the article. Fuck these that's fucking it. assholes. If you pray, you're yeah. an asshole. Hey, fuckers, religion's bullshit. God's not real. If you've ever They're- wanted to realize what people really care about in politics and or religion, it's being shown to you because of this pandemic. And what it is, yeah. is what money you can make for them off your back. They yeah. don't give a shit about you. They don't care about you. The church doesn't care about you. The fucking government doesn't care about you. 
They just want you to fucking die for the economy. That's the way it's always fucking been. Yeah. Yeah. This this pandemic, if you've ever had a question about what the people in power care about, you, you got your answers pretty well fucking done here. Remember when I used to tell you this shit and you said I was cynical? I mean, I agreed with you to a point, but uh, definitely not as 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 far as it went. And I, I I always agree with you with churches, but I always thought you know the government would care. <laughs> I mean, I do. Wait, you're serious? No, I'm just I'm just kidding. I never <laughs> thought the government would care either. But I I how about this? I thought we as a people would care about one another a little. I thought we passed bigger tests than this. There, that's where I was more naive. <laughs> Oh, people fucking suck, dude. That's just the way it is. I, I'm I'm losing yeah, my it, shit here. This movie broke me. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, this movie should break you. It's fucking shit. Well, and it fits with so yeah. Well, it's just it's really fucking good. It just really fucking. I mean, I mean, I don't mean shit as in a bad movie. I mean shit as in it fucking puts you in a dark fucking place. Yeah. Well, and the article didn't help. And this is fucking humanity. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. <laughs> so what you want to think? Like, th- this pandemic has shown me, well, I could watch this movie before the pandemic go, no sisters would ever do that to their brother. No, I'm like, no, that probably would fucking happen. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, this show doesn't work when there are two people that think along the same goddamn lines, and that's us. And I just realized this is going to be our fucking Christmas episode, so this is all perfect. Well, then. This is the next episode to go out before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Happy holidays, fuckers. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're going to play the Ending Legion promo. We're going to have a little bit more music that I janked right out of the film, but apparently was featured in the soundtrack, but was from a band? that One no. of the guys did the score? I don't fucking care. I'm done. Merry fucking holidays. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I know you're almost done when your voice gets higher and higher. <laughs> and we're going to close out the fucking show when we come back. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com com itunes spotify stitcher youtube and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found So once this actually ends, the actual ending of the show kicks in, that's when the music that I was talking about, that band, is going to pop up. Okay, Matt? All right. So the sooner we make the end of the show happen, the sooner that band will just miraculously appear and we can just fucking go to our prospective rest of our nights. Okay? Uh, All right. Well, let's get fucking to it then. All right. So landing and launching page. That's where all of our previous 278 episodes actually is. That's legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops. We are available on our Facebook group, Cinema Psyops, where I removed Matt as admin, made him a moderator, then removed him as a moderator, and then added him again as an admin, but he hasn't actually accepted just yet. That is Matt I just accept, I accepted that. That's... <laughs> 
That is Matt Psyop on Facebook, and I am Court Psyop. You can also email feedback to Matt Psyopmatt at gmail.com and let him know that he has not checked his messenger yet from Facebook, which he is available as Matt Psyop. You can also email feedback to Court, cinemasyopscourt at gmail.com and let him know that Matt has not gotten back to you on Facebook Messenger, where he is Matt Psyop, and I am Court Psyops, and I'm also available on Instagram as cinema underscore psyops, but you could also tweet a couple of tweets to an ungrateful bunch of twats on the hate filled shit fest that is Twitter that is a lot better if you just follow those porn bots. I am Mott Court underscore psyop, and he is at Psyop Matt. <laughs> Holy shit, Matt, we did it fast enough. Here's the end of the fucking show. So everybody kick the fuck out of this weekend, make it. Hello? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, I'm going to have to turn things up a little bit. Made some adjustments over the weekend so I could record for the VD clinic, and now I have to put some things back. Yeah, put a condom on, dirty bastard. <laughs> uh, it's electronic settings, so that doesn't really need to be done. Uh, why don't you still wear a condom, though? I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to help people out. All right, and I'm recording on my side. One, two, three. All right, I still have to download those two clips, but I think I'll have time to do that. <laughs> they are they are fucking hilariously long clips. Probably the longest clips I've ever done. And every week you say that too. Yeah, I mean the the, the clips lately have been just getting longer. It's it's a fact. It's, it's not the it's length a, of the clip; it's how you use it. Ah, it's, it's the motion in the ocean. That's all lies. It's all lies that were told to me. That was weird. Let's fucking Google, man. Fuck Google. Yeah, you're just still surly because uh, of all the shit that happened with you and trying to think you could move files from my G drive yeah. to your G drive and it would be okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I really did. Thought, thought we were going to have a, a grand time there. I'm going to have to try and download these individually just to see if I can get it to work. Yeah, because like, the first one's like 10 minutes long. The second one's not as long. And they kind of almost bookend. Very beginning of the movie and the very end of the movie. Okay, I think I got them. Hang on. Yeah, I got them. I got them. All right, I just got to move them over to where I need to move them to and all that shit. This is Riveting Fucking Radio, brought to you by the folks that aren't prepared on time ever, ever, ever. I mean, it's not like we actually started the show yet. We're just kind of talking to one another. <laughs> no, that as soon as the recording starts, everything gets put out on the air. That's everything, huh? Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah, this sucks for you Do you guys. even um, listen to the show? <laughs> I do, but I just didn't think you'd do it for this stuff. <laughs> no, it gets put into the outtakes, remember? I, like from last week, everything gets put into the outtakes. I know, I'm just saying. I just I didn't know it would be this stuff, all right? Settle down over there. This you stuff? Know. Yeah. You questioning me? That's going to be in the outtakes? Me explaining everything to you for the billionth time on how the actual show that you participate in takes place? That's going to be in the outtakes? Well, now you're just being rude. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the term you're looking for is accurate. <laughs> well, I mean, you're... You can say whatever you like, but I'm waiting for the votes to be counted, so... <laughs> <laughs> I'll fuck right off with that. <laughs> All right, now I'm starting the actual fucking show. I need to look up just to make sure. Give me two seconds here. And once again, this is riveting fucking radio that's going to end up in the uh, outtakes. As I look up the one film I know that we have done and to see if it's a Tygon film. I do believe. Yeah, let's see here. Stupid thing. It didn't even give me the preview. Her sister. And that's our first long ass clip. Nope. <laughs> Ten fucking minutes. Yeah, I told you, motherfucker. Ten fucking minutes. This is gonna be so easy to edit. <laughs> um, let's see here. Sorry. <laughs> My fault again. That's, yeah. Um. Uh.
Get it fast enough, here's the end of the fucking show. So everybody kick the fuck out of this weekend, make it your bitch. I had to come up with some kind of a bit to bring everybody yeah, right? back up at the end of the show. <laughs> it was like micro machines. <laughs> I was trying, man. <laughs> uh, all right, dude, uh, don't forget to send me that recording, all right? Yep, yeah, and I have actually stopped recording on my side now.